Hi, I'm Guy Lawrence and you are listening to the Guy Lawrence podcast. If you're enjoying this content and you want to find out more and join me and come further down the rabbit hole, make sure you head back to guylawrence.com.au. Awesome guys, enjoy the show. Kelly, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's all the pleasure's all mine, mate. I um, I ask a question to everyone on the show, and that is, if you were at a cocktail party, and a complete stranger come up to you and asked you what you did for a living, what would you say? Oh, um, I guess I would say I'm a filmmaker. Uh, you know, because I just did the the film Heal. So yeah, I guess I would say I make films. You know, with the intention to inspire and kind of awaken uh, people. Yeah, and I, and I bet they'd be happy that they've sparked a conversation with you because that would <laughs> probably answer, I have a ton of questions coming from that. Uh, there's no doubt, which I've got for you today, by the way, so brace yourself. But okay. um, uh, for anyone that hasn't seen the documentary Heal, what would the elevator pitch be? Um, it is <clears throat> a film about the innate ability we all have to heal. Um, it's a film about possibility and how our thoughts, beliefs, and emotions affect our biology. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I got to say as well, because I, I went to see it um, just before Christmas, I think it was in Byron Bay near where I am. And it was to a full, full house. Uh, yeah. there, was, there was great intrigue. And, uh, you know, and see, uh, and I'll be honest with you, like, I thought I had a good gig for the last five years. I've been interviewing my heroes and, mm -hmm. and you took it one step further and, and put, it, put it on camera and, and made a documentary from it. Um, what I was intrigued about, though, can you take us back a little bit? Because what led you to look at this work? Because I, I normally find there's like... Um, I don't know, like a tipping point is like a curiosity at first and then it kind of builds up and all of a sudden you, you, go, you, you tip yourself over and then you're in and then you're just ravenous for more information and looking at it, you know. What, what was it like for you? Yeah, you know, it's a tough question because everybody, um, you know, or most people would think that, that I had a life event or a diagnosis or something that catapulted me into this curiosity. Um, but I think, you know, I think I've been on a mission, like a curiosity mission since, since college. I think I went away, to, you know, my whole life really, but um, Australia is a part of the story okay. because um, I was not feeling myself in college. I guess I would say I was depressed, um, you know, undiagnosed, but like I was angrier than usual and I just, I lived such a happy life before then and I wasn't feeling myself. I, it was hard to connect with people. I went to Berkeley um, in Northern California and, uh, and so I decided to transfer back to UCLA and in that time period, my brother was traveling to Australia to do a photo project because he's a really amazing photographer. So I said, you know, can I come carry the camera bag or... So we went to Australia, we traveled and, um, you know, I just kind of started a lot of self-reflection and actually a guy that I met gave me the book Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. Okay. And I read it on the way home, on the plane ride home. And it just like cracked me open to, I think that, uh, you know, the depression came from really just not, not feeling that life had any purpose like I just didn't I didn't have it was a crisis of um faith. Uh, how old were you at this point uh I think I was 20 oh wow that's such a cool age to be looking at this yeah 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 uh, and so, since, yeah please continue what happened so you, you read Marianne Williams's book um yeah and it just it made so much sense it resonated in such a way that you know we we have a choice in every moment to view things from fear or from love, you know, and God is love. And it just resonated so deeply to me because um, I was raised Catholic. And as much as I loved the history and the stories of Jesus and everything, I, uh, I didn't, there was something missing, you know, or the traditional religion just didn't really resonate as much. 
So anyways, I went on, that just kind of sent me on like a path of self-realization. And I just wanted to learn how everything works and how energy works and fear versus love and um, spirituality and, and kind of, you know, self actualization, you know, become my yeah. highest self and, 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 a, you know, align with my purpose. So, you know, it was, it was little milestones like that. And then I think, um, you know, I saw the movie, the secret, and that was the first time I kind of learned about, you know, the law of attraction or that our thoughts were sending out signals. Um, and that sent me into reading, you know, um, Abraham Hicks and okay. Wayne Dyer and Eckhart Tolle and, um, you know, and then, and then I went to, started attending Agape in, uh, which is where Michael yes. Beckwith is the pastor and his teachings really empowered me. So it was just all these, you know, kind of this awareness. I kept getting more and more aware of how our thoughts, you know, were co-creators with life. Um, and then it started, you know, the health thing. Uh, when I read The Biology of Belief by Bruce Lipton, I was just like, oh my gosh, everybody needs to know this. We're not victims of our genes. We're actually, you know, our thoughts, beliefs, emotions, and lifestyle choices, our environment really dictate what genes express. So um, I, I, I think after that book, I started thinking about doing a film. So that was maybe 10 years ago now, but eight years ago to when I started the actual making of the film. Wow. And then the final catalyst, I was dabbling in other films, but they weren't really with you know an intention to inspire and empower. They were just entertainment. Yeah. Um, and, and then I read Anita Morjani's book, Dying to Be Me. And I was like, wow, that is what's truly possible. You could be so far gone with zero hope in anyone's eyes that you could recover. And the physical body is designed to recover in every moment. It's always self-regulating and healing. We just need to figure out how to help it and support it or not get in the way at least. So just with her shift in consciousness, her body recovered. And I was like, wow, everybody needs this right now. We need, we need hope and empowerment and, and awareness. You know, until you're aware, you don't, you're kind of a victim. Totally. Yeah, it's interesting to say, I've got Anita coming on in a couple of weeks, actually. And oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the first time I heard her story, I was like, really? You know, but, it, but I, I, I was open to it. And, that's the, and I think that's the key thing with this with this whole work and this message, we, we can kind of dismiss it and go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's, there's, so, much, um, there's so much weight with it now. And, and even f from that, what the, the science, when you start looking up, like you say, Dr. Bruce Lipton, who's just an amazing guy, Joe Dispenza, Greg Braden, like there's, there, there's actually huge science that's coming behind it and, and proving that these possibilities are real um, for it, which is, I think, amazing and which is what you captured so eloquently in the documentary you know it was a very real approach at the same time which is just beautiful just beautiful Thank you. how how was it received it's received really well it continues to be received very well um we really wanted to um do kind of a high like a hybrid distribution model because we felt that it it um you know, it just felt like more of like a grassroots kind of movie. It wasn't, it wasn't a movie for the critics, you know? So we, um, we decided to have, we kind of based it off uh, two films that, and their strategy that was very successful. Um, the movie I Am with Tom Shadiak. Yeah. And uh, the film Awake about Paramahansa Yogananda. Um, and so they kind of did a, they, you know, they kind of did their own theatrical release and they did a bunch of screening events and they made it available for people to host, get together a community and host screening events. And then, um, and then it, later it was released digitally. So we hired an events team and, you know, lo and behold, all over the world, people wanted to, based on the trailer and social media that we've been building, um, they wanted to host events. And so that really got the, grassroots conversation going and and people not only wanted to see it multiple times but they wanted to share it with their loved ones because you know 
like you are well aware, <laughs> so many people are sick these days. And, you know, yeah. um, so it worked, you know, it just got, it kind of, it just has this life of its own and it's a little bit of a movement. And I think divine timing, it wasn't ready to be done and maybe it wouldn't have been received as well 10 years ago, but yeah, you know, I was ready to go and everything kind of unfolded in a, <clears throat> in a flow. It was really like a flow process. There was an energy behind it and I'd kind of, I might've been steering the wheel, but there was definitely an energy doing it all. How did you feel like, you, you know, cause I think about when you, put something to creation and you put it out there. It's almost like burying your soul at the same time. You know, it's like this, okay, this is me. This is it. I'm, I'm, I'm all in. Cause we, we can spend half our life hiding behind that. Mm. Almost not even aware of it, you know, that we were doing it. And yet you've gone, what, what was it like when you, you're like, okay, it's going out. <laughs> Terrifying. <laughs> it really was. It was, it was really um, vulnerable for me. I knew probably because I was in it. And that was a big decision, you know, my producer and editor, because I kept wanting to hide. And they were like, no, 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 you know, the audience needs you as a bridge to kind of put it into layman's terms, or, you know, you're so, it, it, they thought that I would, it would kind of warm up the film if I stayed in, but I kept wanting to cut myself out and just give them the facts, you know? Um, and so being in it and then having, you know, we did it pretty fast. It was like a really tight schedule, low budget. Like, so of course there was always things I wish I had done differently. So once it's out there and you're like, Oh God, you know, <laughs> I wish I would have done this. So it's, it's vulnerable, but at the same time, the response has been so really amazing. And I know it's, it's helped many people. And, um, you know, I, we get messages all the time that it's like, Oh my gosh, came at the right time or I'm on my fifth time watching the film and I get something new from it every time. So yeah. I just kind of used it as a lesson in the ego and was mindful of how I was feeling in every moment and, and trying to like be gentle and, yeah. and it, uh, it almost yeah. forces you to do the work while you're, while you're, you're talking and doing it. Correct. We were, yeah. we were my whole crew too. You know, we were, we were very conscious of like how stress um affects us you know we had to live what we were kind of you know quote unquote preaching yeah. uh so we all grew and we all healed different aspects as we were yeah doing. yeah beautiful i love it absolutely love it and you know and with the my intention with this podcast as well is obviously reaching out to people like yourself and 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 everyone that's talking about this work and doing different things but the one thing i i, I want to do is to help inspire people go after what it is that their heart truly desires, you know? And, and I think that takes, I, I interviewed a guy called Joshua Mance the other day. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he wrote um, a book called Beauty of a Darker Soul. Okay. And he actually got shot by a sniper and flatlined for 15 minutes. It was quite yeah. incredible. Uh, and now he's, he's come over his trauma and he's, he's just an amazing human being. But he said to me on the podcast that it takes more courage to, to look within and, and honor your truth than it does to, to run into any firefight. Wow. And you really put it into perspective. And I thought, wow, that's, that's just amazing. And so with that in mind, I, and I think it's easy to take for granted, you know, people who look at your documentary and go, amazing, well done, pipe on the back, job done. But there must have been a point of bravery of courage or something to go, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put it all out there. Cause you, you're certainly not going to know if it's going to flop or if it's going right. to make it or like, yeah. where does that come from? This really felt like a calling. It just, it was okay. like so loud that there wasn't even, it was almost just like, okay, it was such a strong pull that I didn't, I, at a certain point I just stopped questioning. And I was just like, all right, well, I mean, if you're giving me this, this clear message that I need to make this film, like, I'm, I trust that it's all going to work out, you know? So, um, you know, and I've done other projects where I don't have that. This is the first time in my life that it's been that strong of a pull. So I just, at, at a certain point, just surrendered and was like, okay, it's, 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 it must be done. Uh, detach from the outcome and just do it because my intentions were pure. I wanted to empower yeah. people like I had been empowered by teachers that empowered me. And uh, 
and then just let it go because I couldn't deny that like pull, you know? Who was the first speaker you reached out to? Oh, um, the first person we interviewed was Darren Weissman, but I'm trying to think. Uh, I had a mutual friend with that new Deepak Chopra. And so she set up a meeting and, but I'm trying to think who, I think Bruce Lipton, he was like the one, you know, Bruce Lipton and Michael Beckwith were like kind of really shifted my life. So I went after them first and um, I actually went to a celebrate your life event. I think they do them in in Australia as well, but they were all- it's not Hay House, but it's a different, it's, it's similar. Okay. So, um, and they were all speaking this one weekend in Arizona and I just went out there and kind of gave the elevator pitch of what I wanted to do. I got the assistance numbers and then sent the deck or whatever, my vision. And, uh, you know, they just one by one started saying, yes, yes, yes. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. And did, did you, did you have like this, um, this practice every day where you kind of had this vision of how it was going to look and go and, and continue to reinforce that as you were continually stepping into the unknown or was it just like it was just coming through and I'm just pushing, I'm just going. Yeah. Um, sorry. Did the, That's the, inter- the internet froze for a minute. Um, I guess I think I was just like, I'm going to interview them. I'm going to ask the questions. It came from a genuine curiosity. I really genuinely wanted to know what is possible. And if anything, including things like ALS and really gnarly diagnosis can be, can be cured or healed, you know, if your body can recover from anything. Uh, so that was kind of the driving force, just a genuine curiosity okay. for myself, you know, and then I was just like, and then I'll share it with the world. Um, and, and I met with, you know, it was the first time I had done a documentary. So I met with a couple different filmmakers and they all recommended, you know, do an outline, be organized, but my brain just doesn't think that way. So I just, I kind of winged it. Like I said, here, you know, here are the questions I want to ask. And then um, in editing is when we actually wrote and weaved everything together. So we kind of wrote it, in, you know, after we knew what we had and Got what you. we we pluck the most important um, lessons, you know, to, to paint the picture. Yeah. So, so then every speaker is almost given their own lesson to, to paint the, the bigger picture with everything. Was, was, there, was there anyone that, like, took you by surprise in terms of, like, like a wow factor? Because you were looking at this work and we can kind of take it for granted a little bit. But um, Yeah. Um, hmm. I mean, I, I was personally fascinated with the, 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 the guy with the healing with the music and the sound. Oh, yes. He was fascinating. Jeffrey Thompson, Dr. Jeffrey Thompson. Okay. That's exactly who we, um, we went down to San Diego, which is where his office is. Um, and he, I actually found him like last minute. I was listening to the Hay House World Summit or whatever. And I came upon his podcast and I listened. I was like, oh, that's amazing. And I I wanted to include an aspect of sound and music because in every ancient culture, they've used sound as a way, you know, for ritual or healing. So um, met him and we, we set up, he's just a fascinating guy, obviously. He's, you know, this wizard and he's a genius and he, he figured out how to scientifically show, you know, kind of the woo woo things that were happening um in the in real time so i just asked him i had a whole list of questions but i asked him one question basically like what is it that you do (laughs) and uh he talked for 90 minutes and he ended on this like quantum theory about schrodinger's cat in the box and you know the it was like after (laughs) after he stopped talking my producer and i just looked at each other like Like he's a genius, you know, so it was just, it was just so I'm sure like you feel in the podcast, it's so awesome to, to speak to these really brilliant minds. And yeah, I was definitely awestruck when I walked away, walked away from that one. It it is incredible. And it definitely challenges your beliefs. And I find sometimes there's, there's a stretch of a belief and you're okay. And then there's like a chasm 
that you can fall in and just think that, that that's not even possible. But the more you look at the work and the more you can start to actually implement it in a practical way in your life, it, it does start to show up. And, and I, I've actually come to the conclusion, I, I realize I know nothing. And I, I always approach that to everything that I do and just remain open, open to these things as, mm -hmm. as we go along. How did your um, family and friends feel about you making this movie? Do they think, oh, Kelly's lost the plot, or were they curious? Or were they, <laughs> like, um, they were, that's a good question. I think they were all supportive, and they were just like, yeah, you should do it, because, you know, I just, I kind of became that person who, you know, if people just kind of judged me, whether it was true or not, as this, like, pillar of health. Um, and I live a balanced life. I don't think I'm very extreme in, in diet or exercise. Like, I've learned to just be, just enjoy life. And, you know, it's kind of that 80, 20 rule, like eat clean 80% of the time, yeah. do, you know, and, but live life, enjoy, you know, eat a French fry every once in a while. You're not going to, but, um, so they, they came to me. So I think they were all kind of excited too, because they would often come to me for advice. Uh, so yeah, I think they were all pretty supportive. My husband was like, I have no idea what you're doing, but <laughs> I support you. Uh, mm -hmm. And now he's really, he's like really, you know, proud and, and like, oh, you know, wow. It's, it exists. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, fantastic. How do you, do you have any, like from everything you've learned and, you know, you're in the minority, you've been exposed to all these amazing teachers and doing this work. And I, I remember when I, because uh, Joe Dispenza was my entry point, really. I'd actually mm. done, I'd actually done an ayahuasca ceremony about five years ago uh, that cracked me wide open. Yeah. And, um, and then fr from that point on, I kind of got it, but I didn't get it. And I continued to look. And then I went to, uh, I interviewed Joe back in 2015. And he was literally yeah. holding a workshop near me a couple of weeks later. So I went down and caught up and, and did his workshop. And then ever since then, my life's changed, basically. Because then it yeah. You know, but it, it's like this chasm of information and it's like, I guess my question I'm trying to get to is how do you bring all that with everything you know now? Like what does your practicality day look like? Do you have any practices or things? How do you implement it? Or do you have any rules you kind of live by? Like what would your advice be to someone else going, you know, I, I'm, I'm so keen to learn, but I don't know how to start. Like what would you say? Yeah. I know it's a tough it, question. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, I, it, it varies, it changes, you know, it evolves, but um, I think currently I definitely try to meditate every day mm -hmm. because um, I just feel like, you know, everywhere in the world, I mean, maybe not in like, you know, central Australia, like on the, on the plains, but like we're inundated with information, right. And technology. So I think it is crucial to, shut disconnect um from it, external and go within um and i just heard a beautiful quote this morning it's like you know silence is not silent it's filled with you know once you get your mind quieted down it's like a crazy stallion going you know crazy with stimulation and then you start to quiet it down and it is a practice and it is cumulative you know the yeah. more you do it and the more regularly you do it that stallion you know is generally just gets calm in everyday life. Um, and I just think it's so important because it, it, it really does reset the nervous system, you know, from a biological standpoint. And then from a spiritual standpoint uh, and an emotional standpoint, it really just decompresses and lets go of stress and build up. And it also allows that kind of intuition or guidance to, you know, your higher self to come through and, and kind of give you guidance. Yeah. And, uh, do, you, do you fully trust that now, you, that, that intuition that comes through? Because I only ask because I know many people have this urge or these feelings, but then they grip with fear to take the first step and, and, and then they continue in that cycle. Are you completely just, I'm, I'm all in every time something wants to come through or is there still? There's always hesitation, but I, I would say that that's probably the biggest thing that came out of making this film. I really, because we were on such a tight uh, schedule and budget, I was literally just like, I found my voice and I, and I really honed that skill of like, I'm just gonna go with 
what I feel and I'm not going to question it. And luckily I had a producer that really trusted my instincts as well. And, and just was like, well, that's not what I would do it, but I'm sure you know what you're doing. So let's just follow you. And it worked out. So it, it gave me the opportunity for two years or a year and a half to really hone that skill and see that it continually worked out. And, um, and also, also having the belief and learning, uh, the belief about life that, you know, there's no wrong or right decision. It's like, it is what it is. You chose this and it's exactly what was meant to happen. So to, mm -hmm. to start to ha cultivate that belief system about life, that the universe, God is always um, supporting you and always, you know, pushing you to your highest unfoldment. So you can't make a mistake. You know what I mean? It, everything is meant to be. So that, that helps you not, that helps you get out of resistance. It helps you kind of pick yourself back up if you have a so-called failure or mistake and, um, and go. So if you have that belief about life, it's a little easier to follow your instincts because you're not so fearful that it's the wrong thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so then those, you know, my teachers and people that I've worked with have really helped me trust that. Totally. Yeah, it's great. I actually, I have a, cause I, I'd made a huge decision last year and I basically sold my company and stepped down and moved into this world full time. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's, oh. and, 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 and the challenges come thick and fast. Like it's amazing. But I, I've held them. Somebody said to me once, no pressure, no diamond. And, um, and I, and I, and I held on to that mantra. Like you can't believe like every yeah. time I f feel that. And, and it's amazing what you can, I don't know, and train that muscle, if you like, and, and continue to just keep edging your way forward. And there's always a lesson. There's always an initiation. There's always something that you see a part of yourself that you never knew was even possible. And we yes. sometimes need that discomfort right. to, to find it and honor it, even though we hate it when it's happening. <laughs> a little uncomfortable, but yes. <laughs> No pressure, no diamonds. That's exactly right. Yeah, 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 totally. I, uh, I wanted uh, one other question before we, we change gears as well. Like with it, and this is more for the, the listeners as well, but with the documentary and everything, because I'm from uh, the health industry, so I worked in the fitness industry, and, mm -hmm. and emotions were never looked at. Mm -hmm. for, for results when it ever came to our health, you know, on, on, a, on a superficial level, whether it be weight loss and fitness, but even then on a, on a deeper level was, um, you know, illness or overall health itself. Like how much do you think now from everything, you know, the, our emotions play a role in actually our health itself? I, I think it's, it's everything. I think it's emotions um, and, and your your core beliefs, you know, which a lot of our subconscious beliefs are actually really disempowering negative or limited beliefs. So I started to pay attention to things. I would notice like if I'm on the treadmill running and I'm thinking about something that makes me stress or I'm thinking about someone that pissed me off, um, I get tired easily, you know, but if you, if, if, you know, if you've just fallen in love or you just got, you know, you just closed your book deal or, or some amazing piece of news, you feel that energy in your body. You feel that vitality and you could run, you feel like you could run a marathon in that moment. So emotions really do affect your energy levels. Um, I also believe that, you know, a lot of weight loss for a lot of people, you know, they can't lose that 10 to 15 pounds or 20, you know, whatever your, the relative weight is, you know, I often see that, you know, it's protection, you know, that, that extra layer is protection or lack of self-worth. So you have these self-sabotaging, um, but it's all energy and the energy is, you know, really affected by emotion. And, and then the last thing is like, um, are you familiar with Masaru Emoto's work? Yes. Uh, the hidden messages in water. Yes. Yes. So we're 75% water. Uh, much like the earth and, and, and water responds to intentions that you said. And so um, if you are, if you have some sort of trauma in your past or you have this belief, you know, of inadequacy or lack of self-worth, you're going to be sending intentions into the mirror or, or beating yourself up all day. That negative intention, um, that kind of self-hatred 
affects, literally affects the cells and the health of your cells because we're made of water. Um, and that's what his work shows. So I love that book. I think it's just, it's so telling, you know, if you send an intention of, if you put on a bottle of water, the label of love, if you play it to classical music by one of the masters and Beethoven, Mozart, when you freeze that water, it's these beautiful, perfect harmonic um, crystals. If you put a label of hatred or I hate you and you play heavy metal music, uh, you know, the, the crystals are just disjointed and, and break apart. So, so the harmony is gone. And so I really feel that like, you know, that practice of self-love, you know, will help. It's, it's kind of like living from, from the, um, excuse me, living from the end result. You know, Joe Dispenza talks about causing an effect. You've got to look in the mirror and love your body and love yourself before your body is going to get to that ideal place you want to be. But most people are just beating themselves up. And so it, it has that, it holds on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you, you, you're waiting for the external to then justify your happiness. Like you, I, when I reach and achieve something and look, right. just, just to add to that. And I, I just want to reinforce what you just said, because, you know, um, I interviewed, uh, are you familiar with Lynn McTaggart's work? Yes. Yeah. I actually watched her interview on yours just to see how... Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I've been, with my community, I've been actually holding um, group intentions. And, and I just got her book, so yeah. Oh, mate. And, and we've, we've done about four or five now, and there's... But it, it's reinforced, because I'm like, I need to know that this is fact and it's not just kind of a woo-woo thing that is easily mm -hmm. off the roll of the tongue and, and we've actually been honing in with one person but the intention carries a, a, it carries a real energy and we've been able to move that energy within a person of that emotion that's been trapped in their body mm -hmm. and it's coming out in different ways and it's been mind-blowing i'm like we've been doing this th this year and i'm thinking holy shit why doesn't more people know about this right you know and yeah. um it's amazing amazing stuff yeah and i love that you know and that you know i i want to study it more because you know i, I wish that she was in my film because it's it is it's so amazing but she, you know when she says in your podcast that what she finds is that the people sending the intention are actually getting more healing than the one who's being sent to so the one who's receiving so that to me is just like so metaphorical of like how giving and a life of service and of all of that is energy that actually benefits you way more than the the beneficiary of your generosity absolutely absolutely and i think that you know like you said at the very beginning because i was nodding my head like the intention of you just wanting to bring this message to the world and and just you know, the, it does what it does, but it's it's that what we bring into anything we do, whether we're washing the dishes or or, or making a movie, is crucial. I think you know. It's, totally. Yeah, it's amazing, mate. I'm going to change gears. I got some questions that I want to ask everyone. Okay. And um, the first one is, what's one of your low points in your life you had, but later in life turned out to be a blessing? Ooh. Um. Hmm. I would say, I'm guessing kind of the same situation, you know, I spoke of before when I was at University of Berkeley, California, Berkeley, and I thought it was the weather that was kind of affecting my mood because it was gloomy. I was from Southern California where the sun always shines. Um, but again, I realized that it was a little bit of a crisis of faith. I didn't have a true north, you know? Um, and I wasn't connecting with friends, which is so not like me because I was, you know, I've had the same friends I've had since, you know, we were five years old. Um, so then traveling to uh, Australia and meeting the guy who gave me Marianne Williamson, it just seemed like, you know, that book then opened me up on this, this huge path, you know? Um, and yeah, I think that it was definitely a low point in my life because I'd never experienced any sort of depression before, yeah. or, you know, so it just kind of made me aware like, oh, there's some unresolved things inside of me that I need to heal. 
Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I'll have to read that book. I've heard so much about it. I've never read it. I've never read uh, it. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's an oldie, but it's a goodie. Yeah, I have no doubt. That's normally the way. That's normally the way. Um, what does your morning routine look like? So, um, it's a great question. I usually get up. Um, I open the window for fresh air. I love listening to birds. We live kind of on this canyon, and we have this beautiful backyard, so there's tons of birds in the morning. And then I make my husband and I coffee um, and we sit there and then I'll, I'll actually go meditate later. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it depends. I mean, sometimes I'm really good and I don't pick up my phone and I meditate straight away to set the tone for the day. But usually, usually I like to have coffee with him. So it's kind of immediate before he takes his son to school and and I clean up my inbox because I'm one of those people that likes it on zero at all times. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and I have my like inspiring daily emails, um, you know, that kind of teaches me, like, uplifts me. Yeah. Uh, so, and then, you know, I'll meditate um, and then, you know, get to work or whatever. Um, and then I, in the afternoon, I'll usually try to meditate again, or at least go out in the backyard and, and put my feet in the grass and just like totally disconnect and feel, you know, I just feel like that grounding and that earthing kind of counterbalances all of the invisible EMF <laughs> pollution it, and huge, all of yeah. these Wi-Fi things, you know, like, so I, I just feel that that kind of boosts my vitality. So I try to do that every day. Yeah, no, I, I hear you there. I'm quite lucky where, where we live in the Embira Bay because I'm right by the ocean. I, I walk barefoot. Yeah most of the day nobody gives a shit around here yeah <laughs> Basically, and you can be completely yourself you know which is kind of cool what um what med style of meditation do you normally practice is it do you vary it or i vary it kind of based on my capacity for the day i like i was taught i learned transcendental meditation so i have you know mantra um and then i also learned um what is it called i went to the chopra center and learn primordial sound meditation, which based on your birth time and date, they give you a mantra that is supposedly in line with where the stars were on the day you were born. Okay. Um, which is cool. <laughs> and then, uh, and then I, you know, I listen to various guided meditations um, yeah. just so I can like, you know, if my, if my mind's going a little crazy, just, you know, the sound uh, helps the sound waves do its thing while the voice kind of takes you on a journey. And, and I like that too. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, if you could have dinner tonight with anyone from any time frame, dead or alive, oh. who would it be and why? Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. That's so hard. <laughs> what would it be? I would, it would be maybe, um, <sighs> This is great. Great question. It's hard to pick one. How do people pick one? Yeah, people struggle, that's for sure. I would. Maybe, uh, I don't know. I mean, there's so many people. <laughs> <laughs> I would say um, perhaps like Abraham Lincoln or maybe Amelia Earhart. My, I, my family is a bunch of pilots and... Uh, I want to know what happened to her, you know? <laughs> what, what was the story? I'm not familiar with Amelia. Oh, Amelia Earhart. She, um, she was the first female pilot. Her, her co-pilot was actually this guy, Fred Noonan. And our, my maiden name is Noonan. Um, and all of my grandparents, my grandfathers, my dad, and my brother, they're all pilots. Um, so she was the first, she set off to be the first female pilot to, to fly around the world and they went missing and nobody knows what happened. And they, it's this famous, famous, famous story. They don't know if she was kidding, like her plane went down and you know, the Japanese took her prisoner cause it was around wartime. Um, or if she, you know, was lost in the Bermuda triangle, which I don't know if wow. you know the Bermuda triangle, but lots of mysteries go on there. So, that would be a very cool conversation. That would be a very cool conversation. Wow, what a brave lady. That's amazing yeah. to do that. Wow. Um, what's one thing about yourself most people wouldn't know? Ooh. Oh, my goodness. Um, 
Most people wouldn't know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Do people struggle with this? Sometimes. Uh, I, 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 I had uh, Chris, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Chris Cresser, but um, I had him on the show and he said, I, I actually love going out dancing. And I was like, wow. Okay. Ah. He's the last person I suspect that you do that, actually. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. I guess, uh, well, I have, uh, how many, I have three grandchildren. I'm a stepmom, but step-grandchildren. People, don't, people think that's funny. Um, and I guess I would say I'm a really good snowboarder. I don't huh. think people would know that about me. Fantastic. It's like my yeah. best sport, but... Yeah. That's amazing. I'm embarrassed to say I've never tried it. Oh, it's so fun. Do you surf? Because you live. I do surf. Day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. Oh, it'd be amazing. I'd love to get down to Threadbow and do it. I should. Uh... Uh, it's especially if you surf. It is like there's nothing. You know, it's the same as kind of being in the pipeline or being in the tube, the green room, as they say. Uh, is the same as like when you're snowboarding and powder you're just literally like floating floating free amazing yeah cool um and la last thing is is there anything else you'd like our listeners to ponder on after everything we've discussed today oh um i think my new and joe dispenza really got me thinking about this you know it's always I really want to, or my, my new thing is like, I really want to exercise going beyond what we believe is possible. It's, it's so easy to stay within limits of what is normal or what society says is possible. So I'm really trying to exercise that muscle and, and, and practice going beyond what I think is almost impossible, you know? And it's like the, the Roger Bannister uh, four minute mile Thing. You know, it's like everyone thought it was impossible. Just it was fact that it could not be done until he did it. And then within a month, you know, 20 other people did it. Yeah. Um, so to just continue, like, don't get stuck in the, it's not possible. Like always push it, you know, start to look and imagine and fantasize of what's, you know, beyond what you think is possible. And, and that best case scenario, I think that's the other thing is to become aware. And I tried to say it in the film and hopefully came across but our minds are so programmed to go to the worst case scenario just for survival we're always looking at like oh and and it we go there but that that is an a, that is a possibility that hasn't occurred yet so but if we focus on that it's more likely to occur so just just it's such a great practice to to focus on your best case scenario you know get out of anxiety and let, like let's take a moment shut our eyes and let's fantasize on the best case scenario, get those positive chemicals flushing through our body. And then again, it's all energy. We're sending out that positive frequency into the universe and bringing more, you know, things in alignment with positivity, you know, that rather than going to the worst case scenario and fearing and stressing and anxiety, you know, it's just, that's the easy thing to do. Do the supernatural thing, which is, focus and fantasize on the best case scenario totally i love it and it's practice yeah, yeah it's absolutely practice. yeah you know, and you get better at it there's, there's you do. No, no two ways about it it's beautiful so for everyone um wants to check out your doco heel where can they where can they see it now is it what, what it's platform? um it's on itunes and amazon um and or you can get you know order a dvd hopefully we figured out shipping it was pretty expensive internationally but i think inter amazon ships the dvd you know, at a reasonable price. Um, and you can go to healdocumentary.com um, and order it there. It'll connect you, you know. Um, and then also you can sign up for our newsletter because there's always big events people are holding. So there might be an event coming to your neighborhood and maybe one of the experts will be speaking. So that's cool. It's a really good film to watch with others because it sparks conversations and then you never know who you're going to connect to you know, you may meet the healer you need, or you may get the piece of information by, from someone who went through what you're going through. Totally. So, um, or if you want to host an event, you can uh, email events at healdocumentary.com um, and follow us on Facebook because we always post, we do Facebook lives and, and really kind of continuing the conversation, you know, and people can find answers there. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you so much for coming on the show today. And, and thank you for, 
everything that you do, like it's, it's having a huge impact on people's lives and, um, and it's influencing mine too and, and yeah. draw great courage from it. So everything Thank you do you. is really appreciated. And Thank thanks you. For Thank you for on. having me. You're awesome. You're welcome. Thanks, Kelly.